So I'm going to talk to you briefly about lipid disorders. This is something that you see every day. Um, so um, I'll just go over some things that are um, interesting, important, uh, not only from a practical point of view, but maybe for some of your board exams and things like that. So the first thing, I mean, what I'll cover is basically some basic aspects about like a protein transport and metabolism and how this causes problem, then go over, you know, the, the um, recommendations for management of lipid disorders, um, and so that's what I will cover. So basically, there are a couple of things that I want to mention. Obviously, uh, cholesterol and lipids uh, have two sources. There is endogenous uh, production of cholesterol and um, triglycerides, but there is also exogenous sources of uh, cholesterol and triglycerides. The important thing here is to remember that uh, the transport of these is an active process. Cholesterol is transported by a sterile transporter uh, protein uh, into the intestinal um, cells. And this is important to us because of two things. Uh, I mean, this is a protein. There are known mutations in this that can cause uh, disorders of lipid metabolism. And also, the drug that we use, azitimib uh, or zeria, is a protein uh, is a drug that blocks this particular uh, protein. So that's what causes. Uh, I mean, that is how it reduces the cholesterol levels. Then there is this other protein. So when the cholesterol gets into the cell, then it has to be acetylated, you know, esterified to form the cholesterol ester. And um, this is for the plant sterols that are absorbed. You know, uh, there is another protein that will transport it out if it is not esterified. And a mutation in that causes what is called a cytosterolemia. So you get accumulation of plant proteins. And that does cause a problem where, you know, you do have uh, tendinous xanthomas that you can see. Uh, and it is not an elevation in cholesterol, it's an elevation in cytosterols. And that can also be uh, treated with a drug that can decrease cholesterol and other plant sterol transport. So um, if any of you have filled out a form for getting um, uh, azitimib approved, the first question that will ask, are you treating this for cytosterolemia? And if it is true, then it will be approved. You know? But you know, cytosterolemia is a very rare disorder, but that is something that we know uh, that can cause this uh, problem. Now, there is another protein here. So the cholesterol ester that is made um, has to be packaged into uh, a chylomicron. So uh, there is the ApoB48, which is the protein of, that, um, of the chylomicrons. However, you need a transport protein. Uh, that is MTP, uh, which uh, t uh, puts this cholesterol ester into this. Now, uh, there is a mutation of the MTP, which causes a disorder called as a beta lipoproteinemia. So in those, you do not have any chylomicrons. So, um, so these are disorders that we know are present um, in, due to uh, defects that occur within the transport of cholesterol uh, from the intestinal you know, uh, lumen into the blood. Now here, of course, from there it goes uh, through the lymph. Um, you know, the chylomicrons go through the lymph uh, and into the systemic uh, circulation. So then, um, once they're in the circulation, then, you know, the cholesterol, um, the chylomicrons, you know, their triglyceride and cholesterol esters are what they have, predominantly triglycerides, because the food is more triglyceride than cholesterol. Um, so what happens is they have these three apoproteins, the ApoB48, which is the main protein, but it also has ApoE and ApoC2. Uh, these are important because for triglycerides, that are in the chylomicrons to be cleared, um, they need to be acted on by lipoprotein lipase. But without the APOC, uh, they cannot uh, they can activate lipoprotein lipase. So APOC deficiency causes hyperchylomicronemia because this um, will accumulate in the blood. So they'll have high triglycerides because you cannot clear the triglycerides that you have absorbed. So as you clear the triglycerides, you also will eventually, um, the, you will lose the, uh, the ApoC. Um, and then, of course, you have ApoE that is present. ApoE can bind to the LDL receptor, and that's how uh, the chylomicron remnant, which is now a bit, um, contains a bit more cholesterol than the chylomicrons themselves, 
are taken up by the liver, and then the cholesterol is further metabolized in the liver. Uh, of course, if you have a, a problem with APOE deficiency, so if you have um, you know, mutation of the APOE, then you will again accumulate the calomicron remnants, and because they are lit rich in cholesterol, you know, uh, then you can cause atherosclerosis. So this is dysbeta lipoproteinemia. So in this one, you know, you get an accumulation of calomicron remnants. Um, so this is the thing that uh, you have to remember with the transport of just cholesterol. This is what the exogenous pathway of uh, lipoprotein uh, metabolism is. The endogenous pathway, of course, um, starts with the liver, which is where uh, much of the cholesterol that is in the circulation comes from. And, of course, the sources of cholesterol is de novo synthesis, but it's also getting it from the intestine, as I showed you, and also uh, the cholesterol that's coming back from the extrahepatic tissues. Um, and the main protein that it is packaged in is the um, VLDL particles, which, are, uh, which contain the ApoB100 and <coughs> ApoC2. And again, the ApoC2 is needed for the lipoprotein lipase to remove cholesterol, uh, the triglycerides, so they become uh, intermediate density lipoproteins, which have uh, more cholesterol as triglycerides. And then, of course, um, you know, you get the LDL particle, which is then taken up uh, by the peripheral tissues uh, through the LDL uh, receptor. Of course, this uh, pathway here, the atherogenic pathway here, does not is not through the LDL receptor. It's an LDL receptor. I mean, these are taken up through a different pathway. So that's why, as you accumulate LDL in LDL uh, receptor defects, uh, you will accumulate uh, cholesterol in the macrophages and blood vessels and other sites where it can cause uh, atherosclerosis. So, um, <clears throat> of course, you know we we know of, of um, you know, defects in LDL uh, receptors. And we also know that, you know, uh, increased synthesis of, of uh, ApoB and VLDL causes uh, combined hyperlipidemia. There is uh, excess of triglyceride and cholesterol in individuals with combined hyperlipidemias. And then this is the reverse cholesterol transport or the HDL pathway. Um, so, um, again, cholesterol has to come out through you know, the eight, well, one of the ATP binding cassette proteins. Um, so if you don't have this, you will have very low H, uh, HDL cholesterol because cholesterol does not come out of these. Um, and then, of course, you have the enzyme LCAT. So HDL, the main um, apoprotein there is uh, ApoA. And then the LCAT will, you know, esterify your cholesterol esters. And CETP is a very important um, uh, protein, cholesterol esterase transfer protein, which transports cholesterol um, into these uh, you know, s smaller particles. Uh, and if you have a deficiency and, and then eventually gets removed by the um, liver, so um, if you inhibit this, then you can increase the levels of HDL cholesterol. Uh, and you will have less of transport going into these other VLDL and LDL. Uh, particles. So, um, CTP mutations are known to cause uh, an increase in HDL cholesterol, and of course now there are drugs that are being studied, uh, which are CTP inhibitors, uh, which can increase your HDL cholesterol. None of them, of course, are uh, yet available uh, for clinical use. So, this is the basic pathway uh, that you should remember, and you know, at different sites that you can have. Uh, uh, mutations that can cause, you know, familial or genetic forms of uh, uh, hyperlipidemias or dyslipidemias. And, uh, of course, many of the common varieties don't have a mutation. They're not single gene defects. There are multiple gene defects or uh, have other causes. So this is the uh, list of genetic uh, <coughs> lipid abnormalities. So, you know, you have the triglyceride-rich, um, you know, lipoproteins are hypertriglyceridemia. The important ones that you have to remember is lipoprotein lipase deficiency, um, which is associated with very high levels of triglycerides because that's what clears triglycerides from chylomicrons and also uh, from the VLDL. Uh, again, ApoC, as I showed you, ApoC is needed for the activity of the uh, lipoprotein lipase to remove triglycerides from the um, lipoproteins and calomicrons, so APOC2 deficiency also causes an elevation in triglycerides. 
Familial you know, uh, hypertriglyceridemia is, uh, is polygenic, uh, and as I said before, a beta lipoproteinemia is associated with low cholesterol because you, know, you, can, you don't absorb uh, as much cholesterol because it's, the cholesterol is not being uh, transported into the uh, chylomicron. So it causes uh, low cholesterol, low triglycerides, low LDL, and you know, HDL uh, will be uh, normal usually. Then you have remnant lipoproteins, which is the, with the APOE. So APOE mutations will cause increase in triglycerides. Uh, as I showed you before, if you don't have APOE, then the chylomicron remnants cannot be removed from the circulation, so you will accumulate um, you know, triglycerides. And it is associated with low HDL uh, cholesterol. Then, of course, the um, there are three main mutations uh, that can cause uh, an elevation in LDL cholesterol. One is a uh, LDL receptor uh, deficiency, which is a classic familial hypercholesterolemia. You have the ApoB uh, mutations, which again cause increased LDL. Uh, and I'll talk about PCSK9, um, the mutation uh, which can also cause an elevation in uh, LDL cholesterols. There are certain other mutations which can cause a decrease, which is hypobeta lipoproteinemia, which is the ApoB deficiency, which causes decrease in the um, LDL cholesterol. So these uh, ApoA1 deficiency, as I showed you, ApoA1 is the main uh, protein of uh, um, the HDL cholesterol. So ApoB, uh, ApoA1 deficiency causes low HDL. So does the transport protein, which transports cholesterol out of the cell uh, into the circulation, so mutations of this uh, will cause a decrease in HDL, and uh, LCAT deficiency will cause a decrease in HDL. CTP, the cholesterol is for transport protein, is actually involved in transferring the cholesterol onto other um, uh, lipoproteins, so if you have a mutation, uh, an activating mutation, uh, it actually increases your HDL cholesterol level. So these are the different um, abnormalities that are present uh, that are familial types of hyperlipidemias. Now, th th of course, there's also a long list of uh, secondary causes which we should evaluate whenever um, uh, it is, you know, uh, we think there is a strong, you know, uh, that those can be prevented. So particularly, you know, for cholesterol, diets rich in fat, particularly diets rich in Cholesterol will increase both cholesterol, triglycerides, LDL, and uh, HDL. And you should remember that when you have increase in total cholesterol, your HDL cholesterol also goes up. So a lot of the times when we pay, put patients on very strict diets, so if we change someone uh, who's, who goes on to um, a weight loss program and they're put on a, um, a meal replacement plan, um, what you will notice is that they will have a, a market drop in cholesterol, but their HDL also drops quite a lot because, uh, the, but as a percentage of loss, you know, you'll see a much greater loss of uh, decline in uh, total and LDL cholesterol than of HDL cholesterol. The HDL cholesterol will decline if you are on a low-fat diet. Uh, alcohol intake, of course, will increase your triglycerides and could increase HDL, uh, and of course, physical activity um, will also increase your HDL cholesterol. Um, Medications, importantly, uh, are corticosteroids, um, will increase triglycerides, and you should also keep in mind um, thiazide diuretics, beta blockers, um, uh, estrogens, testosterone, and um, some of the uh, immunosuppressants that we use for post-transplant patients and antiretroviral medications. These are all known to increase mainly triglycerides, but some of them also increase cholesterol and LDL cholesterol levels. So that is something that we have to keep in mind, particularly if you're seeing a lot of patients um, in a transplant clinic or in HIV clinics, you will see uh, abnormal lipids uh, in these patients that need to be addressed. Type 2 diabetes is typically associated with elevated total and LDL cholesterol and primarily with triglycerides and a low HDL cholesterol, partly related to um, weight and dietary uh, problems, so they may be more amenable to lifestyle intervention. Lipodystrophies are not common, but you know, um, the, the, the main problem in these patients with lipodystrophy is their inability to store fat in, in adipocytes, so they have more circulating triglycerides. Um, 
uh, lipodystrophies um, can be generalized uh, or could be localized. The ones that cause the problem are uh, generalized lipodystrophies. Uh, they're usually diagnosed by looking at their physical appearance. Um, they have sunken face and they have loss of uh, subcutaneous fat. They look very muscular because there is no subcutaneous fat. So you can see their muscles. You think that they're working out, but they're not, you know. Uh, and then, of course, you know, there is, um, you know, very little subcutaneous fat that's seen. Um, other endocrine problems like hypothyroidism uh, causes an increase in lipids, mainly because it decreases clearance of lipids. So both cholesterol and triglycerides are not cleared uh, normally in patients with hypothyroidism, so you have elevated levels of um, uh, lipids. And uh, estrogens, of course, increase triglycerides mainly, and you, their effects on the liver. And corticosteroids, again, increase uh, triglyceride levels. Uh, Chronic renal failure um, associated with increase in HDL, um, LDL cholesterol and a decline in, uh, in HDL cholesterol. Cirrhosis um, can also be associated with uh, in, um, increased uh, levels of triglycerides, low HDL, uh, and of course the congenital biliary atresia is associated with uh, increased LDL cholesterol. Um, and of course starvation with uh, decrease in LDL and an increase in HDL. So. Secondary dyslipidemias are something that you have to keep in mind because you have, when you examine the patient by history uh, and on lab tests, uh, you should be able to try to pick up the abnormalities so that we don't treat things that are not necessary to be treated. Now, for the triglycerides, uh, the main thing that you have to be looking at is, you know, uh, genetic history and then obesity, type 2 diabetes, alcohol, uh, diets high in carbohydrates, renal disease, hypothyroidism, and then um, a, a long list of medications uh, that can cause an elevation in triglycerides. Now, these are the common, uh, you know, uh, genetic disorders. I gave you some of the examples. The, the 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 common ones are, of course, the you know heterozygous uh, familial hyperlipid uh, hypercholesterolemia. Uh, the prevalence is 1 in 200 to 250 in the population. These are the three main mutations that's associated with LDL cholesterol elevation. Uh, homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia is usually associated with very high levels. The cholesterol levels are usually uh, LDL cholesterol are in, uh, well over 250, 300, or 400. Uh, and uh, again, it's the same mutations, but they are homozygous uh, and very markedly elevated LDL, and fortunately they are rare. And of course, they're very difficult to treat. Uh, familial combined hyperlipidemia is the most common and is, um, you know, uh, there, it's a multiple gene defect. There are multiple modifying genes. There is an increase in LDL, increase in VLDL, increase in ApoB. One of the interesting things with this is that uh, family members can have different uh, profiles. They all have elevated cholesterol, but some may have more LDL, others may have higher triglycerides. So. In familial combined hyperlipi uh, hyperlipidemia, you can have different uh, combinations in any given individual within the family. Um, then lipoprotein lipase deficiency is very rare. Um, there's marked increase in chylomicrons. Uh, Tangier's disease uh, is uh, absence, you know, is the um, absence of the um, HDL, so they have very low HDL levels. It is due to the ABCA1, which is the transport protein that transports cholesterol out of the cell, uh, and then you have familial LCAD deficiency. So these are rare, but you know uh, some things that you have to keep in mind when you see someone with a very low HDL cholesterol level. So uh, you know the um, lipoprotein protein lipase deficiency uh, obviously is either. I mean, this this is the enzyme where you have deficient, but also you could have. APOC2 and um, abnormalities that can cause an inactivation of lipoprotein lipase. The absence of lipoprotein lipase increases your triglycerides. The thing about it is uh, you see them with, uh, you can see them with recurrent uh, pancreatitis. And then uh, adaptive xanthomas, um, on, on fundus examination, you may be able to see retinal lipemia. They can have hepatosplenomegaly. Um, and again, it's an autosomal recessive inheritance. These are the types of xanthomas that you see uh, in patients with um, uh, the uh, of, uh, familial 
uh, lipoprotein lipase deficiency. So this is something that you may be able to uh, find quite easily. Now, disorders of LDL receptor are rare, as I showed you, either a defective uh, protein or the absence of the receptor itself. These are the Palmer xanthomas that you can see. You can also uh, have them. They can have tendinous xanthomas um, and uh, arcus uh, in the cornea. Uh, so these are some of the skin signs that might uh, lead you to, to uh, make a diagnosis of uh, uh, hyper cholesterolemia, and, and these people have very high levels of uh, uh, LDL cholesterol. So, so from a clinical perspective, the main thing that we have to remember uh, with lipid disorders is other than the problem that some of the patients with very high triglycerides can have recurrent pancreatitis, the major focus of um, treating lipid disorders is uh, cardiovascular disease prevention. Um, so we're looking at patients who are asymptomatic, um, unless until they have a, a cardiovascular event. So that raises some challenges in terms of convincing the patient that they need to do something about their cholesterol. Uh, and then also, you know, um, you know, trying to understand, you know, what are the guidelines and um, what we need to, uh, to screen for and treat. So until 2013, there was a different approach uh, with the... Um, you know, ACC, AHA guidelines that came out in 2013, uh, basically the focus was somewhat um, different from what it was prior to 2013. And um, they, you know, used uh, extensive um, uh, literature review and looking at all the studies that are there to look at the um, you know, type grade of evidence that is there and the level uh, of uh, you know, their recommendation, how confident they can be uh, as to whether or not some you know, treatments would be helpful or not. So the, the main focus here is to reduce cardiovascular events. That means there are a number of drugs um, that will lower cholesterol, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they will lower cardiovascular events. So if they didn't lower cardiovascular events, and particularly cardiovascular mortality, these were not considered as being uh, sufficient for us to actually make a strong recommendation to use these drugs. So um, all of them emphasize the adherence to a healthy heart and you know, a healthy uh, lifestyle as a foundation of risk reduction, and that is very important because this is something that uh, any of you who have been in the wards would have recognized that you know, post MI, they get their you know bacon and eggs for breakfast. <laughs> so that itself kind of it's a self-defeating thing that you know we're trying to give them a better. Uh, I mean, they get 80 milligrams of Lipitor, but they also get their you know high-fat diet. So you know it's important for us to recognize that we have to do better than that. Um, and then they recognized that there are four main groups uh, that they identified as being people who will benefit from uh, using statins. And the entire uh, recommendation, statins are the only drugs that they actually recommend. Um, the other ones are kind of, if they don't respond to statin or they can't tolerate statin, and kind of a, um, you know, uh, afterthought uh, rather than the main focus of these recommendations is about the main thing is about using statins. Um, so, you know, uh, they identified four of these groups. One, of course, is the patient with uh, uh, you know, established cardiovascular disease, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, coronary artery disease. The second are uh, individuals with very high cholesterol uh, and who are young, I mean, who are uh, over the age of 21, uh, so more than 190 milligrams per deciliter. And then for primary prevention for patients with diabetes, uh, if they're over the age of 40 and less than 75, uh, and an LDL between 70 and 189. And then primary prevention for those without diabetes, so if you're using a cardiovascular risk score, uh, scoring uh, system, if the risk is greater than 7.5% over 10 years, um, you know, then they would be considered, uh, and also age uh, 40 to 75 with, you know, with uh, LDL 70 to 189, because if they were one, over 189 or 190 in the bowel, they would automatically be uh, treated. So these are the four categories that they uh, identified. So uh, when we evaluate our patients, this is something that we have to uh, keep in mind. 
there are certain other some caveats that we have to remember. So these are all, um, you know, th the main focus here is on LDL cholesterol level and not on the total cholesterol, not on non-HDL cholesterol. So these are some things that we look at it in a different perspective later on. But the first thing that you're going to look at is to see, you know, what we need to do about LDL cholesterol. Um, because that's where you have the strong, the, the greatest uh, impact and the data that is there is also strong for use of statin in patients with uh, these high levels of uh, uh, risk. So, so the non-statin therapies, as they said, they did not provide uh, risk reduction benefits and safety profile compared to statins, so they focused on the statins. Um, they also did not recommend a specific goal LDL. Uh, what they recommend is actually um, using a low, moderate, or high dose uh, statin. So, uh, and again, this is based on their interpretation of the data. There's been a lot of criticism about it, and there are other views um, and commentaries on whether or not we should have a certain goal. But the main reason then to check the, during follow-up um, on the levels of the uh, uh, cholesterol is to make sure that they're adhering to uh, the uh, medication and lifestyle recommendations and to uh, look for safety uh, of the uh, medication rather than uh, looking at treating it to a particular target. Um, <clears throat> so... These are their summary recommendations, as you can see. Um, if you are uh, over the age of 21 and you're about, uh, I mean, you're a candidate, then, you know, uh, that is, if you have clinical uh, disease, then you, you know, if you're less than 75, you're starting with a high-intensity statin, uh, I mean, a uh, high-intensity statin, which is, um, then, of course, if your age is greater, you're going to start with a moderate-intensity statin. Then, of course, then if you're not having CVD, then you're looking at the LDL cholesterols that are elevated. Then again, you're going to start with high-intensity statin. Then, you know, the next one is diabetes, where they've divided these into moderate-intensity statin and then the estimated risk greater than 7.5 high-intensity statin. So, um, so in the diabetes uh, thing, that means if you have a diagnosis of diabetes and you're over the age of 40, you're automatically a patient who should be on statin. And then on top of it, if you have additional risk factors, you may want to put them on. That means if you have, um, if you're a diabetic and have, you know, cardiovascular disease, then you're on high intensity statin. So otherwise, you have to be uh, on a moderate intensity uh, statin therapy. So. That is what they uh, used as their uh, definitions, I mean, their uh, recommendations. Uh, what they defined as high and moderate intensity statin therapy, you know, um, high is daily, uh, uh, you know, these are statins that will lower the um, LDL cholesterol by greater than 50%, and those will by uh, 30 to 50% is considered moderate intensity statins. And I'll come to that a bit later. And of course, if you don't meet that, then you go to the primary prevention, and then you know you're looking at the risk. Um, so if it's more than 7.5, then you know um, you're going to have them on moderate to high intensity statin. Uh, if it is between five and less than 7.5, you're you know you're looking at possibly using it. But then you know these are the other things that we have to take into consideration before we start patients on. Um, statin therapy, which is um, what are the benefits, we know how do we calculate that, potential for adverse re reactions, drug-drug interactions, particularly on patients who are on very large number of drugs, um, you know, implementation of uh, heart-healthy lifestyle, <coughs> management of other risk factors, particularly hypertension um, and diabetes, patient preference, and then again, you know, you, you had to discuss with them about it, and then some of them have used other measures, um, particularly looking at family history, um, lifetime risk, and also coronary artery calcium scores or um, you know, CR, you know, highly sensitive uh, CRP measurements. So those are things that we have to keep in mind here. 
So these are the equivalents. That means uh, if you want to do high intensity statins, either 40 to 80 milligrams of atorvastatin or 20 to 40 milligrams of uh, rosuvastatin. These are the drugs that have been known to give you more than 50 percent reduction. Moderate intensity statin therapy, you know, there's a lower doses, or you can use drugs such as simvastatin or pravastatin. Um, and then, of course, for low intensity, you know, you can use much lower doses of these drugs. These are the ones that we commonly use, simvastatin, uh, pravastatin, lovastatin. Um, of course, you can use these other drugs at a lower dose, and, you know, it will, you know, will still be quite effective. So... These are the things that we have to keep in mind. Fortunately, most of the drugs for uh, most of the statins currently are not that expensive. Um, so, you know, Rosuvastatin is probably the only one that is still, um, you know, brand name. Everything else is generic, so you, it's easy to get this approved by the insurance. You know, um, so once you initiate statin therapy, you know, um, if you are less than seventy-five without contraindications. At high dose, and then monitor the statin therapy uh, for uh, adherence and also for any uh, side effects. So, we also look at the same time looking at triglycerides, you know, uh, any unexplained ALT elevations uh, which are important. So, at baseline, you know, um, you're doing a fasting lipid panel, ALT, and CK, and then of course you have to obtain the um, renal function assessment and any other things that you think might be contributing to it, like, you know, doing thyroid levels to make sure they're not hypothyroid. We've seen patients with uh, TSH more than 200 who have been on statin um, because cholesterol being very high. And, you know, once you treat their thyroid disease, they didn't even need anything. So um, you had to keep that in mind. So, you know, use the risk calculator to, to evaluate. There are different risk calculators, so uh, some have one over the other, but the one that they recommend, obviously, is the uh, ATP um, AHA um, you know, uh, risk calculator to estimate the 10-year uh, risk. Uh, and again, as I said, the focus is on statin therapy. Um, so the thresholds are all based on three primary prevention randomized control trials. As I said, this is all based on these randomized control trials um, because the other drugs don't have such a strong um, thing. So if they're not in a statin benefit group, um, you know, you'll have to look at other things such as because just the score alone may not give us enough information. Uh, family history of premature atherosclerotic disease, um, elevated lifetime risk, you know, LDL more uh, elevated, um, current artery uh, calcium score more than 300, CRP greater than tw uh, 2, or an uh, ankle brachial index less than 0.9. Um, so it's a, it's a complex decision at that time. It's not that straightforward, but uh, those are people in which uh, you, you can, again, consider uh, treatment. So then you look at their adherence to treatment um, and see if they are, um, if, if you're getting the uh, desired effect, so if you're using a high-intensity statin treatment, it would reduce it by 50% or so. If not, you might increase the dose if you started on a lower dose. Um, or, you know, uh, as I said, uh, the thing is to use uh, you know, high-intensity treatment, so you don't have necessarily have to do anything more. But most of us, depending on the extent of risk, uh, we might intensify the treatment uh, more uh, and follow up on uh, on these um, you know, treatments to see if um, they are doing better in terms of other cardiovascular uh, risk factors. So you'll have it takes some time to do that. So within uh, usually by six months, you should be able to titrate it to the dose that you uh, want. So, of course, you know, uh, one of the things that we know from the large uh, number of patients who have been on statins is that a significant number of statin <coughs> users have uh, uh, intolerance to statins. Uh, it's estimated that at least the million people in the United States who cannot tolerate statins, so, or have, I mean, it means they develop muscle symptoms uh, during statin treatment. Um, so, if that is the case, then, you know, uh, if they are symptomatic, but they see cases are less than um, you know, four times the upper limit of normal, uh, you stop it for two to four weeks, and then 
If the symptoms pers uh, persist, uh, then re-challenge because it's probably uh, unrelated to statins. Uh, if the symptoms improve, uh, you can switch to a different statin. Um, and then, you know, uh, if they are symptom-free, you can continue it. If the symptom recurs, you know, you go to a low-dose uh, therapy. Uh, and what has been tried uh, actually is to go with a very low dose. Uh, as you can see here, for those who have had uh, uh, marked elevations or rhabdomyolysis, you give a longer washout period. And then use a low dose, which may even be starting with once a day, well, once a week, and then alternate days, and then gradually increasing it to the levels that they may be able to tolerate. Um, so that is what you can do here so that you can use the maximally tolerated uh, dose of statin. So you know, that is something that you have to keep in mind. Uh, and of course, if they can't tolerate that, you can use uh, as a timidity. Um, uh, and of course, now we have uh, other uh, PCSK9 inhibitor that can be used. Uh, PCSK9 uh, or you know, PCSK9 is a protein which is called pro-protein convertase uh, cytolysin kexin type 9. So basically, PCSK9 is a protein that is, you know, um, secreted into the, you know, um, so if this is the uh, cell and the LDL receptors are here, um, when the LDL particle uh, uh, binds to it and is, uh, you know, internalized, uh, so uh, the PCSK9 is also goes with it. And this is important because uh, if the PCSK9 is, uh, goes along with it, the LDL receptor goes into these endosomes and the LDL receptor uh, in the presence of the PCSK9 uh, will undergo degradation and won't recycle back into the cell surface. That means you will have less LDL receptors that are available. So that's how the L so that means you have the cell has to make more LDL receptors. So if you have an inhibitor, a, a, a monoclonal antibody that binds to this, then the LDL receptor uh, is internalized. Um, the LDL is the cholesterol is then uh, released into the cell, and then the LDL receptor comes back, and then it can take in you know it can transport more cholesterol into the cell. So um, that will allow for clearance of cholesterol from the um, circulation and prevents uh, the accumulation of cholesterol and hypercholesterolemia. The additional advantage of using a statin with it is because, as you know, statins are drugs that inhibit HMGCO reductase, which is needed for cholesterol synthesis. So if you have less cholesterol being synthesized, the uh, cell will respond to it by increasing the uh, synthesis of LDL receptor. So when you use a drug like a statin and reduce endogenous cholesterol production, it will increase LDL receptor production. So then the drug PCSK9 inhibitors will actually be even more effective. In fact, a lot of the trials that have been done with the PCSK9 inhibitors are done with statin on board. So, and there are trials which are also by themselves without a statin, but the, a number of the trials are include, includes those with that. Um, we know, as I said, uh, there is about, you know, most of the uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, you know, more than two-thirds of them are due to the LDL receptor, uh, but about 2.3% of um, familial hypercholesterolemia is due to imitation in the uh, PCSK9 uh, protein. Now, these are different, you know, studies that have been done. There's a phase three studies that have all shown a, a significant reduction in LDL cholesterol. And you can see here, you know, there's a quite uh, significant about, you know, 30 to 60, you know, uh, even as high as 70% reduction in LDL cholesterol that you will get with the PCSK9 uh, monoclonal antibodies against PCSK9. So they're PCSK9 inhibitors. Uh, so based on these trials and, uh, you know, the drugs have been approved for use uh, for individuals with uh, elevated uh, LDL cholesterol. And there are some ongoing trials uh, which are looking at heart outcomes. So because as we know, we are more interested in trying to prevent heart disease rather than just lower cholesterol. But from accumulated data, we know that if we can reduce LDL by 70%, we should be able to reduce the uh, you know, um, number of, I mean, the you know, cardiovascular events also. So these are the two drugs that are available 
uh, in the United States. One is uh, alirucumab, which is praluent, and the other one is evolucumab, which is repata. Uh, they have you know, slightly different monoclonal antibodies. Uh, they are, you know, this one is given uh, as an injection, subcutaneous injection, every two weeks. Uh, this one is given um, in every four weeks. So uh, the dose is 140 to 420. This is 75 to uh, 150 milligrams. This is quite expensive. Uh, the annual cost of uh, the uh, these drugs is approximately fifteen thousand dollars, so it's an expensive um, treatment, and that's why there's some you know it's not easy to get it approved, uh, unless of course you show that it is necessary. Um, so you know um, the main indication uh, would be for patients with uh, established coronary artery disease and who have. Um, you know, who cannot tolerate statin, or with statin they cannot reach goal, uh, or for patients with familial hypercholesterolemia who have very high levels of um, um, LDL cholesterol, uh, then these drugs can be used to reduce cholesterol and uh, impact their cardiovascular outcomes. So I will briefly talk to you about some of the non-statin medications. These are not some things that we widely use, but you know these are alternatives that we can use as additional treatment. One of them are bilacid uh, resins or bilacid sequestrants. Uh, basically, they will you know decrease the uh, um, excretion of bile. Uh, I mean, they will uh, bind the cholesterol. Uh, from the, you know, uh, and they will uh, cause an excretion of the uh, cholesterol in the, uh, the bile acids are made from cholesterol. So if you bind the bile acids and they're excreted, then they will increase cholesterol synthesis and increase uh, LDL clearance from the circulation. They can cause about a 15 to 18 uh, percent drop in LDL cholesterol, particularly colocivalum. Um, they can be used as adjunctive therapy uh, for in combination with uh, statin or you know, if you're not uh, achieving goal. They're fairly safe. The main problem will be GI intolerance. And then one of the other things that you had to keep in mind when you use the uh, biosont uh, binding agents is that uh, they could impede absorption of drugs that can uh, that need bile acids or fat soluble vitamins like vitamin D, vitamin A, and also drugs like Synthroid, uh, they all need um, bile acids, so uh, these drugs have to be taken at a different time. So you must give either one hour before or four to six hours after, so the other drugs have to be given at, at the proper timing. Um, one of the advantages of colocivalum is that colocivalum also reduces blood sugar. It's actually approved as a diabetes medication, so you can use it um, in combination with other drugs. It drops the A1C by 0.5%, so it's not a huge drop, but you know, in a patient with diabetes and hyperlipidemia, this may be something that may be of uh, advantage. Um, the, the mechanism is a bit more complex than just bile acids being removed. Uh, it is a very complicated um, mechanism by which both blood sugar and cholesterol are reduced. Then you have niacin, which is uh, you know probably um, completely out of favor now. Um, I don't know if they're still going to ask you questions about niacin, but niacin has been known to reduce both uh, triglycerides and LDL cholesterol. Uh, the only thing is there's not been any hard data to show that they actually decrease um, cardiovascular events. So that's why it's not that popular. The main side effects are liver enzyme elevations and, of course, flushing with the immediate release type of um, uh, niacin. Um, then fibrates. Uh, fibrates, of course, are our primary drugs of choice for uh, patients with very high triglycerides. Um, so for patients with um, severe hypertriglyceridemia, those with triglycerides over 500, uh, then, you know, tri um, Fibri uh, phenofibrate is the preferred drug. You also have gemfibrozil, but phenofibrate is uh, safer and uh, it's a once-a-day drug, so it reduces triglycerides uh, anywhere from 25 to 50 percent. Uh, it also lowers uh, LDL cholesterol and increases HDL cholesterol by 15 to 25 percent in patients who also have hypertriglycidemia. So if you don't have hypertriglycidemia, you know, the effect on HDL is, is not seen. It's fairly well tolerated. We have to be careful about you know, you know, some GI upset. 
but it can also cause myositis. And especially, uh, that's why, we, you know, uh, it's not currently recommended to start on combination therapy, but if necessary, you can use combination therapy. You have to be very careful uh, using statin fibrate uh, combination. We used to use that before, but now with the goals of treatment and uh, with more potent um, uh, statins, we really don't have to use much of this uh, drug. Um, Skip this one. As it may be, you know, um, is uh, Zeriev, 10 milligrams is once a day, and it decreases absorption of cholesterol. Uh, it decreases the, uh, you know, when used in combination with statin, uh, it can lower. Uh, this is just to show that if you use 10 milligrams of atorvastatin, you get you know, about a 35, 36% uh, reduction in LDL. So you can go up to 50% or 54% um, if you add, I mean, if you go up to 80 milligrams, but if you add, uh, you know, uh, azitimibi, you can get that with only 10 milligrams. So especially if they're statin intolerant, that they can only use low dose or they cannot use it at all, then azitimibi uh, may be a good choice. Particularly, uh, the studies are mainly done with the combination treatment uh, with statin plus uh, Zedia that have been shown to be beneficial uh, and also in patients with uh, renal failure. Fish oils are widely used. Again, you know, they're not that much of strong data on, on heart outcomes, but they do decrease triglycerides 30 to 40 percent, so it's mainly used in hypertriglyceridemia. And you have to remember that, uh, that fish oil will increase LDL cholesterol levels slightly, uh, except some purer forms of fish oil. Uh, so there are brand name uh, fish oil drugs which uh, can, which don't cause an increase in LDL. Otherwise, you might see a slight increase in LDL cholesterol. Since our main focus is on LDL, we have to be careful about doing this. However, you know, uh, fibrate and uh, fish oil combinations uh, we often use for patients with severe hypertriglyceridemia who have uh, had episodes of pancreatitis or other have other cardiovascular uh, risk factors. So. There are a number of other slides that I had which are mainly to uh, highlight the importance of lifestyle recommendations for uh, total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol, for triglycerides, uh, for HDL cholesterol. Uh, the main thing that I want to point out is that uh, all lipid treatments should be uh, done with a, uh, with a uh, approach to reduce cardiovascular risk. And one of the things that you have to do is to do uh, a more comprehensive approach of uh, lifestyle intervention and um, you know, medication use. Um, so if you all are not aware, uh, I wanted you to be aware of the fact that uh, we have a cardiovascular disease prevention clinic within the Diabetes Obesity Center. It's on every Tuesday. Um, so. Andrew De Philippus and uh, um, Gavgazi and Rachel Keith um, are there in the clinic. We also have a dietitian and we have a, a research coordinator. We're all in the clinic and we offer comprehensive uh, management of uh, uh, cardiovascular risk, including smoking cessation, weight loss, lipids, diabetes management, and the whole uh, stuff. So uh, if you have you know, people who you want more intensive treatment, more difficult cases, uh, you can refer it to the cardiovascular disease prevention clinic. It's on. T uh, it's every Tuesday in the morning. Okay. Okay. <laughs>